Have you ever wondered why skyscrapers all around the world, including the most stunningly high ones, are always under one kilometer or 0.62 mile in height? And why has no one attempted to build to such extreme heights? The answer does not include the word impossible. On the contrary, it has become quite possible as far back as the 1970s. However, the engineering methods, designs, and construction materials for such colossal structures were not perfected until the early 2000s. This leads us to wonder, what are the main obstacles to building one or two mile high towers? And what are the engineering marvels and construction materials that can be used to build such immensely high buildings? First of all, it is a very difficult task, and the associated costs run in the billions of dollars. Then there is the issue of rethinking structural design. It is not as simple as taking a half mile high tower and adding another one on top of it. You must also understand that building a massive vertical tube that is 500 to 700 feet in diameter and one or more miles high is a complete waste of money even though it is relatively easy. Why? Because no one will rent or buy an office, apartment or hotel room that does not have a window. Most of the floor's space in such colossal tube structures except the outer edges would be simply cubes with no windows, no majestic stunning views, and dark all the time. So it would be a mostly vacant building and a money-losing project. The bottom line here, regardless of a building's height, people will not settle for anything without windows and a good view, especially in high skyscrapers. The solution for this obstacle is to build thin and extremely high skyscrapers that taper as you get higher meaning it becomes thinner and thinner until it is merely a few feet wide near the very top. This created a solution, but also a new problem. The first 300 to 600 feet of a super high skyscraper that gradually tapers will still be simply way too wide and undesirable. Additionally, leaving such giant floor space empty is sort of crazy and a waste of money. The solution for this second issue has been around for a while, and it has been proven to be quite effective. The current world's tallest building is Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It tackled this problem by using a buttressed core where a central hexagonal concrete core is supported by three triangular buttresses, like the fins on a rocket. So what you really get is three skyscrapers that each represent one of the branches of a Y-shaped structure. These three buildings are all attached together by the core, that is the center of the Y. This entire Y-shaped skyscraper tapers as you go higher, which means no matter where you are in the building, you can still comfortably see the outside. William Baker, the top structural engineer at Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, who worked with Adrian Smith on the Burj Khalifa and many other engineers, believes that it is possible to use the buttressed core design to build a mile-high tower. However, these very same engineers still think that the first 30 floors of the one-mile-high tower would still be too big with interior areas too far from the windows and sunlight, thus can only be used for parking, maintenance rooms, storage, large open-concept indoor zen gardens, theme parks or malls and cinemas, among other attractions. This solution by many standards makes the building financially feasible since the upper 500 floors would still be quite desirable for commercial, residential and office use and thus profitable. The second major problem that has also been resolved has to do with elevators. A one-mile-high building with 530 floors can accommodate up to 50,000 people at once, including visitors, office workers, residents, hotel guests, tourists, and you name it that makes it a small city. Current common elevators simply do not cut the chase because they are literally too slow and they cannot even handle the weight of their cables that have to extend a whole mile. Additionally, changing elevators every 100 floors is simply a nightmare. The solution for this dilemma came from the Finnish elevator company Cone, which developed an ultra-lightweight carbon fiber cable called Ultra Rope that could double the distance of an elevator's ride. However, they were beaten by another out-of-the-box invention by the firm ThyssenKrupp that eliminates cables altogether. In this futuristic design, each elevator cabin is outfitted with a stack of permanent magnets that interact with electric coils on the hoistway. The coils pulse on and off to push the cabin in the desired direction. Without cables and restrictions on sideways movement, these elevator cabins can even move in the building shafts in a loop system like a transit bus, or rather a vertical maglev train. Since such a building would require no less than 100 elevators, such a system would reduce that number to merely 25 maglev elevators, which require less space and would free up to 25% of space on each floor, especially the upper floors. Okay, now we will move to the mother of all problems when it comes to building super-high skyscrapers, 
No, it has nothing to do with earthquakes. It is the battle against the wind. Yes, wind pressure can cause entire solid skyscrapers to collapse due to vibrations from sway. No matter how strong the materials used in building a high scraper are, the wind pressure on the building is simply inescapable. Not only the building has to be very solid, but also aerodynamically shaped in a way to reduce the wind pressure and thus the sway. Keep in mind that even a minor sway in the top floors can make you sick as if you are aboard a rocking boat. Any mistakes in the design of a one-mile-high tower, and the builders can end up getting sued for making the top 300 floors uninhabitable due to excessive sway. To solve this issue, firms calculate estimated building sway from the wind as a function of height and incorporate that into the design plan. There are two options, dampen it or confuse it. Many modern tall skyscrapers today incorporate a tuned mass dampener, which is a counterweight that helps balance the force of movement on the building's exterior. For example, the Taipei 101 tower in Taiwan houses a 730 spherical pendulum that sways back and forth, balancing the force of the wind from storms and typhoons. The size and weight of the damper are customized based on the mass and height of the building. The other option is to confuse the wind, meaning builders can design the building in a way to change the dynamics on every floor by shrinking each successive floor plate anywhere between 4 to 8 inches, and or redirecting the wind by incorporating aerodynamic features to ensure the wind does not build up dangerous levels of pressure on the structure. Mind you that second option, which is quite ideal, is not easy since diverting the wind through and or around the surface of a high structure can create a vortex that can batter the building quite hard by causing constant vibrations or cyclic swaying that can worsen until the structure collapses. The solution to this is to direct the wind through and around the building using channels, fins, and soft curves. Calculations have to be quite accurate or the results can be catastrophic. All of this leads us to the matter of building materials. Today, the best material for ultra-high skyscrapers is high-performance concrete, reinforced with microfibers that have been deemed to be stronger than the compressive strength of structural steel. As for the core skeleton structure and foundations, well, there is nothing better than building on the rock bed. However, in places like the Middle East there are simply no rock beds to build on. Hence the Arabs and the firms they hire from around the world have developed several systems that literally defies gravity. One of these systems can be summed up in the most basic engineering terms as follows. The structure for a one-mile tower in the Middle East deserts should utilize a cast-in-place reinforced concrete-bearing wall system with a foundation system of a buttressed core where a central hexagonal concrete core is supported by three triangular buttresses. All gravity and lateral wind seismic loads would be resisted by the system of cast-in-place reinforced high-strength concrete walls that are interconnected by coupling or beams, which allow access into the various zones of the floor plate. This means a one- or even two-mile tower structure in the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, Egypt, or Saudi Arabia does not need outrigger walls of trusses, column transfer girders, and no gravity columns disengaged from the lateral load-resisting system. The magic lies in the walls that are structurally connected and participate in resisting lateral wind and seismic loads and the already tried buttressed core technology. Such buildings would sit on a foundation system that combines piled rafts. A matrix of thick straight shaft augured reinforced concrete piles arranged over the entire footprint of the tower. These piles would be bored to a depth of up to 400 feet in the center of the tower and half that below the ends of the three wings. The entire pile foundation system would be connected by a reinforced concrete raft slab varying in thickness from 3 feet at the ends of the wings to 15 feet in the center of the tower. These piles would also be constructed under a polymer slurry and deliver weight pressure to the ground primarily through friction along the pile shafts. Consequently, a portion of the weight of the tower would be transferred directly to the ground below the underside of the raft slab. And that's how you build not a one but a two-mile sustainable high tower on the desert sand that is highly livable and desirable by customers and also as a hotel and tourist attraction. So honestly, what do you think? Is it worth building such immense skyscrapers that cost billions of dollars? Would such immense disruptive buildings solve urban sprawl and congestion problems? Let us know in the comments section and do not forget to like and subscribe. Thank you.